At approximately 2.30 p.m., we were then able to observe a strange animal with a wide back, a long neck, and a small head. The animal was located at about 300 meters from the edge of the lake, and we were able to advance about 60 meters in the shallow water, placing us at a distance of about 240 meters from the animal, which had become aware of our presence and was looking around as if to determine the source of the noise. Scared of the creature, Dinkumbu, a local villager, began to shout with fear. The frontal part of the animal was brown, whilst the back part of the neck appeared to be black and shone in the sunlight. The animal partly submerged and remained visible for 20 minutes with only the neck and head above water. It then submerged completely. No further sighting of the animal took place. It can be said with certainty that the animal we saw was Mokele Mbembe and it was quite alive, and furthermore, that it is known to many inhabitants of the Linkwala region, an area of swampland about the same size as Florida. Its total length from head to back visible above the waterline was estimated at 5 metres. This document by biologist Marcelin Agnaga describes a sighting he made in 1983 in the remote region of Lake Tele. Reaching for his Super 8 camera, he began to film his sighting. But unfortunately, in his excitement, he forgot to remove the lens cap. Welcome to the Hidden Creatures podcast. Join me, Edward James, as I watch the weird, search the strange, capture creatures, and this week, meet Mokele and Bembe. There are photographs, links, and videos of our creatures this week on our Instagram, at Hidden Creatures Show, so if you want to see what I'm talking about, go online and take a look. Before I start today, if you like the podcast, leaving a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get the show is a great way to help. It will mean that more people will be able to hear us, and if enough people start listening, I'd love to make it a weekly occurrence. Also, don't forget to subscribe so that the show automatically downloads when a new episode is released. Anyway, on with the show. Mokele Mbembe, meaning the one who stops the flow of rivers in the Lingala language, is said to be a large animal that inhabits an area in the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. The most common physical descriptions of the animal describe it as similar to a sauropod dinosaur. Ranging from 8 to 10 metres in length, it has a large bulbous body with a long tail and a long neck leading to a snake-like head. It has four large elephant-like legs, but with only three toes on each foot. Imagine the Loch Ness Monster with tree trunks as legs and you're in the right ballpark. The male of the species has what appears to be a horn or tusk on its head, whilst the female does not. This could possibly be for attracting a mate, fighting, or another behaviour that we're currently unaware of. Most of the locals say that it uses this horn to kill hippos and elephants. The skin of the elephant is rough and similar to an elephant, but with a brownish-red hue, although some describe it as nearer to a brown-grey. As with all of the cryptids we've discussed, there are conflicting descriptions of the appearance of the animal. Now, it turns out it's pretty tricky to lock down a cohesive description of a potentially mythical creature. The main difference in the reports of Mokele and Bembe is that some of the sightings describe a frill. One particularly detailed sighting describes the frill as six horns joined together with flesh. When I first started researching Mokele and Bembe, I immediately doubted his existence. The last sauropod, to our knowledge, went extinct approximately 66 million years ago in the KT mass extinction event, which wiped out 70% of life on Earth. And even if some did survive, the film Jurassic Park has taught me that you can see the heads of sauropods poking out from above the tree canopies. So with the amount of aeroplanes that are now in the sky at any one time, surely somebody would have seen one. After spending some time looking into the sightings, I discovered that Mokele Mbembe is much smaller than I originally anticipated. At 10 metres long, it's about a quarter of the size of some sauropods, and stands at approximately 3 metres tall, slightly smaller than an African bush elephant. It's not just the size of the animal that leads to its evasiveness, it's also the habitat in which it lives. 
Recently, government officials in Congo said that 80% of its 66,000 square kilometres is uncharted. Of this 52,800 square kilometres, much of it is dense and often flooded forests, so they could very well remain hidden. If the animals have existed since the Cretaceous period, or evolved from a different animal into now what resembles a small sauropod, we must assume that there's a breeding population in the area. Let's say 100 animals. That's one animal in every 528 square kilometres, or two animals in an area the size of Hong Kong. Now think about how hard it is just to find the right sock in your drawer, or a pen in your backpack. The Pygmy tribes and the Baka, native to the area, say that the animal dwells in Lake Tele and the surrounding areas in and near rivers with a preference for deep water. Local knowledge suggests that the most likely place to find Mokele and Bembe are at the bends in rivers, where it digs tunnels for hibernation. These caves, large enough for the animal, then get walled up, leaving only small ventilation holes. In an expedition featured in the television series Monster Quest, a team of intrepid explorers discovered what they thought was a hibernation hole, but due to how mud hardens in the sun, they wouldn't be able to excavate without an extensive collection of heavy-duty power tools. Their guide, however, tried to figure out the depth of the cave by reaching inside whilst holding a two-metre-long stick, and it didn't touch the back. This hibernation behaviour might sound odd to some, but hippos actually use a similar method, moving in to riverbank caves to rest during the rainy season. When the Mokele and Bembe isn't relaxing in its very chic, mud-walled caves, it has a habit of flipping over canoes that sail over the top of it. Locals are often asked to row hopeful investigators out onto Lake Tele, where they're often seen, but the fear of the animal is so great that they often refuse. In the Western world, we have an unpleasant habit of being dismissive of the stories and experiences of indigenous peoples, because getting constant updates about the Kardashians popping up on your phone every five minutes obviously indicates a more sophisticated cultural knowledge. But we should honour the sightings and stories of wildlife that get passed down from generation to generation. We've made this mistake in the past, but due to being proven wrong throughout history, we now know to research outlandish claims before writing them off. The Matsis tribe in Peru claimed a sticky substance excreted by the monkey tree frog would make a hunter invisible to prey and give them superhuman endurance. When biochemists finally studied the secretions, they found it contained chemicals that would suppress hunger, thirst and even pain. It also contains powerful diuretics and laxatives. This flushing of the body might make the hunter less visible to animals that you smell as their main sense. The sightings of Mokele and Bembe's are not just in the history and folklore of the tribes that inhabit the area around Lake Tele. In fact, in 1960, the Bangombe tribe killed and ate the animal. They would fish daily in the channels of water at the north end of the swamp, but the channels were also used by Mokele and Bembe to enter the lake. Annoyed at their fishing being continually disrupted, the tribe erected a barrier made of sharp wooden stakes to stop the large creatures. Later, after arriving back at the water channel, they saw two animals attempting to break through the barriers, and a fight ensued. The tribe were able to kill one of the animals with spears, which was then prepared for food. This job took several days due to the size of the animal. A celebratory feast was held where parts of the animal were cooked and eaten, but the celebration didn't last long, as those who ate it fell ill and eventually died, perhaps from food poisoning, perhaps from a toxin in the flesh. Fugu, a puffer fish, is full of poisons that paralyse muscles and lead to the diner dying from asphyxiation unless prepared correctly. Perhaps Mokele and Bembe has a similar poison. The earliest recorded sighting by someone not part of the local tribes came in 1776, when French missionary Levin Bonaventura Proyard recorded enormous footprints in the area. Although he did not see the creature, he claimed it must have been monstrous. The marks of the claws were noted on the ground, and these formed a print of around three feet in circumference. In observing the posture and disposition of the footprints, they concluded it did not run and that it carried its claws at a distance of seven or eight feet from the other. 
Footprints this large could only be made by elephants, but Bonaventura clearly states the appearance of claws, which elephants don't have. This very early written report is backed up in more writings in 1913 from a German officer and explorer, Ludwig Wier von Stein zu Lauschnitz. He had been ordered to conduct a survey of the German colonies in what is now Cameroon, and during his time there he heard stories of a huge reptile that lived in the jungle. Although his report was not published at the time, it was included in later publications. He wrote, The animal is said to be of a brownish-grey colour with smooth skin. Its size is approximately that of an elephant, at least that of a hippopotamus. It is said to have a long, very flexible neck and only one tooth, but a very long one. Some say it's a horn. A few spoke about a long, muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animal is said to attack the vessels at once and kill the crews, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river, in the clay of the shores at sharp bends. It's said to climb the shores even at daytime in search of food. The diet is said to be entirely vegetable. This feature disagrees with a possible explanation as a myth. The preferred plant was shown to me. It is a kind of liana, with large white blossoms, with a milky sap and apple-like fruits. At the Sombe River, I was shown a path said to have been made by this animal in order to get to its food. The path was fresh and there were plants of the described type nearby, but since there were too many tracks of elephants, hippos and other large mammals, it was impossible to make out a particular spore with any amount of certainty. These two written accounts both come from people who had not gone to the area with the intent of discovering a new animal. But in recent years, people have gone hunting in the hopes of being the one to put Michele and Bembe into the science books. Expeditions through 1985 to 1986 led to no discoveries, but on a Japanese expedition in 1988, video footage was taken which allegedly shows a Michele and Bembe moving through Lake Tele. Filmed from a distance whilst flying, the cameraman struggled to maintain a steady shot, but was able to capture 15 seconds of footage. Although the feature itself is very blurry, a noticeable wake is clearly visible behind it. Skeptics have claimed that this video just shows people in a canoe, or that it could show elephants swimming. But if elephants can swim on the surface of Lake Tele, couldn't an unknown animal do the same? The most famous Michele and Bembe hunter is William Gibbons, who has been on five separate expeditions to find the animal with varying results. On his first expedition, coined Operation Congo, Gibbons had the unfortunate luck of being robbed by a fellow explorer and found no traces of the creature. They did, however, find a new subspecies of monkey, now known and classified as the Crested Mangabe Monkey. This itself proves there are unclassified animals in the depth of the jungles. The second of Gibbons' expeditions, creatively named Operation Congo 2, was launched six years later in 1992 and again failed to provide any concrete evidence. However, this visit was not a complete failure, as he was able to document more sightings and legends about the creature. A colleague on the expedition, Roy Nugent, was able to take two photographs of an unidentified object beneath the water's surface and claims that one of them is the animal's head. Unfortunately, I've been unable to find this image, so if anyone stumbles across it, please let me know. It was then in 2000 when Gibbons made his next visit to Africa, this time to Cameroon. Whilst visiting a pygmy tribe, he was told about a creature which they call Nungubu. This animal, a prehistoric-looking horned creature, was identified in drawings as a Styracosaurus, a dinosaur similar to a Triceratops. The locals said, one of these animals was killed by a member of the tribe a generation ago, but in recent years their numbers have dwindled and are much more difficult to find. This new description of the animal is very different to the usual reports of Michele and Bembe, so maybe there's more than one new species lurking in the forests of Central Africa. The hunt for Michele and Bembe later made it onto the Sci-Fi Channel and the History Channel, and interest for the creature rose again. Destination Truth aired in 2008 and featured Josh Gates and his team heading to Zambia after recent reports of sightings in the area. 
For most of the expedition, they didn't see or hear anything to suggest the animal was near. But when they visited Lake Banguelu, they managed to capture what appeared to be Mokele and Bembe half-submerged. It was only on reviewing this footage that they realised they had actually managed to capture images of hippos with their heads breaching the surface. In 2009, an episode of Monster Quest which showed the discovery of the hibernation I mentioned earlier did reveal something. Whilst in the river, sonar was used with an underwater camera to try to see if the creature was in the depths of the river. Unfortunately, the camera was unable to detect anything, as a recent storm had stirred up the sediment, but they were able to catch serpentine shapes under the water on sonar. A lot of cynics claim that the lack of physical evidence proves the animal doesn't exist, and Robert T. Carroll, a prominent skeptic, says, Reports of the Mokele and Bembe have been circulating for the past 200 years, yet no one has photographed the creature or produced any physical evidence of his existence. Recent evidence discovered about the life and behaviour of sauropods from the time of the dinosaurs is also changing opinions. It was long thought that sauropods mainly inhabited swampy areas and lived on aquatic plants, but new findings suggest that they actually preferred dry woodlands, feeding on tough conifers and ferns. Although very few images of the creature exist, the most important evidence comes in the discovery of large footprints that don't match any other known species. In 2004, researcher Peter Beach went to Africa to try to discover the animal. On the muddy banks, he discovered large footprints with three claw marks, echoing the 1776 accounts, where it seemed a large animal had climbed out of the river to graze on the foliage on the overhanging branches. The tracks were fresh enough that he was able to take plaster casts of the print, and shows the size of the print at being approximately one foot across. Looking up at the branches, they could see they were bare up to five metres high, the perfect grazing height for Mokele and Bembe. With only small fragments of evidence suggesting the animal is real, but huge amounts of eyewitness testimony, people have regularly quizzed the locals on whether it's real or a mythological creature in their folklore. But as explorer Adam Davis says, when you put it to people, is this a real creature, they become quite affronted and they consistently came out with physical descriptions. Whilst I love the idea of a dinosaur existing into the 21st century, we have to look at alternate explanations of where and why this story became so embedded in the folklore of so many local tribes. During the BBC documentary Congo, members of a tribe identified Mokele and Bembe as a rhinoceros. Neither species of the African rhino is common in these areas, so it's argued that Mokele and Bembe is a mixture of folk tales and bent memories from a time when rhinos inhabited this area. Others argue that Mokele and Bembe is not a sauropod who has existed since the time of the dinosaur, but is an animal that has evolved into a shape that we recognise as a sauropod. According to Roy McCall, he claims it's unlikely that the animal is either a mammal or an amphibian, leaving a reptile as the only plausible candidate. So perhaps Mokele and Bembe is a distant relative of a monitor lizard or iguana that's evolved into an unusually large size in the Congo Basin. Whether or not you believe in Mokele and Bembe, remember, there is, and always has been, a beauty in the unknown. Into part two of the podcast, where we take a look at an animal that was once a cryptid, but now has its place firmly in the science books. This week, the Okapi. The Okapi, also found in the Democratic Republic of Congo, is a strange-looking animal, appearing to be a chimera of a zebra's striped legs, the body of a donkey, and the head of a giraffe. Through the 19th century, stories of an African unicorn began to spread between Westerners in Africa, and famous explorer Henry Morton Stanley had reported seeing an odd donkey-like animal when he journeyed through the Congo in the late 1880s. And although the Okapi doesn't have a horn like the unicorn, it was just as mythical. The males of the species do have short, hair-covered horns approximately 10 centimetres in length, which the females do not. 
they have fashionable whirls of hair instead. An adult usually weighs between 200 to 350 kilograms and its body is covered in a short reddish-brown fur. The Akapi's nearest relative is the giraffe and they are the only living members of the family Giraffidae. Whilst they look very different to a giraffe standing only one and a half meters tall with zebra stripes instead of giraffe spots, they do have one thing in common. A long, dark, extremely flexible tongue which both species use to strip leaves and branches. Although the neck of the giraffe is so much longer than the Akapi, both animals only have seven cervical vertebrae, although they are much larger in the giraffe. Okapis are solitary animals, who only usually come together to breed, and it's this solitary behaviour and their camouflaged patterning which kept them secret from Westerners for so long. The natives of the area knew that the animal existed, but the visiting Westerners doubted its existence, thinking it was too fantastical to be a real creature, but instead thought it to be a creation like the griffin or centaur. Even when the skins of Okapis were shown to Westerners, they still doubted their existence, sure the indigenous people had somehow faked the stripes. Some, however, finally began to wonder if the creature was real when skulls and skins were sent to scientists to study. It was this that allowed the researchers to get funding and eventually, in 1901, a live animal was captured, which put all scepticism to rest. The discovery of a large animal in such recent times led to the Akapi becoming a symbol of cryptozoology and was even used in the logo of the International Society of Cryptozoology. Okapis are on the endangered species list and their small numbers means we know very little about their behaviour other than what is studied in zoos. We have however learned that they're found in densities of one animal per two square kilometres and although each animal's home range overlaps, they'll mark their territory with urine and faeces. As with a lot of endangered species, one of the major threats is that they face habitat loss to expanding human settlements and logging. Thankfully, in 1987, the Okapi Conservation Project was set up to help protect the animal and their habitat. Please check out their website, okapiconservation.org, and if you have any money left at the end of the month, consider donating it to save this beautiful animal. In this, the final section of the show, we take a look at the lighter side of cryptozoology. And in today's episode, we hurry after the hoop snake. The hoop snake is an animal said to be found across the United States, Canada and Australia. The name hoop snake describes the animal's method of attack, where it places the end of its tail into its mouth and rolls down a hill towards its victim like a bicycle tyre, and then in the last moment straightens out, skewering its victim with a venomous stinging tail. They have apparently been clocked travelling at 96 kilometres per hour when rolling downhill, so good luck outrunning it. If you spot a hoop snake racing down a hill towards you, the best thing you can do is look for a fence to climb over as the hoop snake has to uncurl to slither under on its belly before it can chase you again, giving you a good chance to escape. And escape you should because its deadly sting is said to be so poisonous that even if it strikes a tree, the tree will instantly wither, turn black and die. The animal is even mentioned in a letter from 1784 where the author writes, As other serpents crawl upon their bellies, so can this. But he has another method of moving peculiar to his own species, which he always adopts when he is in eager pursuit of his prey. He throws himself to a circle, running rapidly around, advancing like a hoop, with its tail arising pointed forward in the circle, by which he is always in the ready position of striking. It is observed that they only make use of this method in attacking, for when they flee from their enemy they go upon their bellies like other serpents. From the above circumstance peculiar to themselves, they have also derived the appellation of hoop snakes. Sightings of hoop snakes are still occasionally reported, although no evidence has yet been strong enough to prove the animal's existence. To encourage the hunt for the creature, the naturalist Raymond Dietmars has placed $10,000 in a trust for the person who is able to prove the animal's existence. Either he really wants people to go out and find it, or it's one big gamble to say he's sure it doesn't exist. Snakes are known to swallow their tails, and there is photographic evidence of this, 
but it isn't known for definite why. It's argued that stress and overheating can lead to confusion, and others argue it's purely a case of mistaken identity. If helped quick enough, the snake can survive, but often this behaviour leads to the death of the animal. The most famous snake eating its own tail is Ouroboros. The name, from the words Ura meaning tail and Boros meaning eating, shows a snake in the loop of eating itself, and it's thought that our symbol of infinity is based on this image. The Ouroboros is found in many cultures throughout the world's history, from the enigmatic Book of the Netherworld in Egypt in 14th century BCE to Greek and even Norse mythology. Whether or not the hoop snake is a new species, strange behaviour in a known species, or just a mythical creation, just remember that just like with the Daleks, your best defence is climbing a set of stairs. Hidden Creatures is written and produced by me, Edward James. If you want to get in touch with me, perhaps you want to suggest a cryptid, tell me about a sighting, or maybe want to claim the $10,000 reward for seeing a hoop snake, visit the Hidden Creatures Instagram, at Hidden Creatures Show. The script was edited by Saskia Wellesley, full credits in the show notes. See you soon, and happy hunting.